Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Hollingworth, and I'm the president of Grameen Foundation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Magda, and the, the Live Week group for hosting this. Real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, the topic I'm going to talk about is digital technology and social impact. And, uh, you know, I'm going to venture a little bit off topic to begin with, but get it back to it, I think. Um, it, in, in our view at Grameen Foundation, da digital data is offering probably the greatest potential we have at the moment to overcome the information asymmetry that really is at the heart of global poverty. Uh, this, this needs to become the focus, I, we believe, of our efforts to address global poverty, and we need to find ways of managing data, digital data, and digital identity in a responsible way that places human development at its core. There, there's an interesting, I think, divergence happening in the, in, in the impact investing space and in the digital data space. In the impact investing space, there's a convergence of thinking around creating funds, around government even spurring activity in impact investing, uh, and you know, there's, there's a, I think, a coming together around how investing can impact big social problems. I think there's more of a divergence happening around data, right? And there are different perspectives globally to data that I, I want to talk a little bit about. You know, I'm, I'm very encouraged by activities with China, the EU, the United Kingdom, Japan, etc. Uh, in the establishment of hybrid financing vehicles that blend private capital with, with government capital. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. in particular has been watching on the sidelines of this whole discussion, is really not in the middle of it, but there is some hope. You know, there is a bill uh, before Congress uh, related to the establishment of the United States International Development Finance Corporation, and that essentially would be an agency that would facilitate private sector capital and skills to come in and participate in economic development in low and lower middle income countries globally. Its mission is, as it's defined in the Act, is to sustain, is to facilitate sustainable broad-based economic growth and poverty reduction for development. You know, this idea of blended finance is getting a lot of interest. You know, the G7 recently in the Charlevoix commitment in Canada on innovative financing for development basically highlighted the need to, to, to promote this. And it's very, very consistent with the trends that we're seeing globally. Uh, you know, the expansion of foreign direct investment, the expansion of, of middle income uh, markets in and of themselves the ability of national governments increasingly to finance development. And, and blended finance creates a very good opportunity to, to expand our scope for accomplishing the sustainable development goals. But one of the things that I'm very concerned about with the Development Finance Corporation Act in the U.S. is that there's not a clear definition of what kind of outcomes we're committing to. Right? Are the investments going to see outcomes in health and livelihoods and infrastructure that truly impact the lives of the poor? Are these initiatives going to support gender equality and women's economic empowerment? Are they going to be a, is, are these investments going to be a vehicle for more sustainable environmental efforts? You know, we, we need it to operate in very close transparency related to the goals that we have for social develop for the social de the social development goals. So that's a very big gap in, in our government's thinking here. But this this the move towards blending finance is a is a good one. But to me, one of the major gaps that we're seeing at the moment is that this vision, I think, is very constrained. It's constrained because it's not really leveraging what I think, what Grameen Foundation believes is, is really the, the transformation of our times. And that is our ability to understand a very poor person in detail right? and to use that understanding to help that person and to help the agencies and the actors <coughs> around that person. So digital data really is at the center of a very big transformation that can happen, that is happening, but it goes beyond just focusing on dashboards about accomplishing agency objectives. More importantly, it's really about leveraging the data that we can distribute and that we can collect, that we can push and pull uh, as a way of opening opportunities for the poor to create their own future and for the rest of us to understand those needs and opportunities and to act better on that information, decision-making, better decision-making by everyone. And today, this, the digital technology and the rise of mobile money and the use of mobile phones, even in the poorest and remotest areas of the world, 
really creates an unprecedented opportunity for us to begin to understand those needs and opportunities uh, of reaching the poor and, and figuring out the best way to support. So we're at the cusp of, uh, of using digital technology and data-driven information to better understand the individual uh, and to deliver a wider range of, of services that are both personalized, individualized, and scalable. And th this doesn't necessarily replace human contact. It, it enriches it. It can enhance it. So, uh, you know, the, the, the vision I think that we need to bring together for our, the future of developing sustain, of, of impacting the sustainable development goals would be one that would, would, would solve some intractable, pro intractable problems, would create economic opportunity, and would also, I think, define a very responsible role for a government like ours in the U.S. Uh, around, around data. At Grameen Foundation, we do use uh, uh, data-derived insights to deliver appropriate financial services to women and families. Uh, we do this to enable smallholder farmers to improve their productivity, and we provide poor communities with access to health, health services, and health finance, all using digital platforms. Grameen Foundation was founded in, in 1997, inspired by the work of our, our leader, uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus, uh, of course the founder of the Grameen Bank and a global leader in, in, in so many areas in, in the poverty fight. Uh, he's still really very active and supportive of our work. His, his attention has shifted away from microfinance and has become much more about uh, social business and how business approaches and business strategy can reach and to solve the problems that poor people face. Uh, it, it's essentially about how uh, you know, the user and the payer uh, become aligned in sustainable enterprises that serve the poor, uh, live and breathe beyond the philanthropy or beyond the, the aid that exists. And in our first decade at the Green Foundation, we basically were an incubator of microfinance institutions. Uh, we supported uh, you know, the establishment of microfinance institutions globally expanded lending base of, of those groups and reached in excess of, a, of a, about 11 million people. Over the last uh, decade of our life, we've been focusing largely on more of a multi-dimensional approach, identifying solutions that uh, build on the strength of the poor but put technology to work, uh, strengthening their livelihoods, their health, and their financial security. And we continue this work now uh, of blending our, our partnership work with technology outreach. Uh, we've essentially, we're able to reach about 25 million people now with our work, and data is at the center of it. I often find myself saying that uh, the, the breakthrough that was microfinance was dependent on one data point, and that was, does the woman in the village have the trust of other women in the village? And would they back her, right, from, the, from her character to, for, the, for the loan? What's opening up now to us is, with digital data, is having multiple data points to begin to create a much more complete understanding of the individual situation uh, of a poor person. At the moment, globally, there's 70% of our, of our world's food sources is from smallholder farmers. And frankly, we know nothing about them, right? We know nothing in a systematic way about them as individuals, and we don't have the ability to collectively understand and categorize problems or opportunities that they, that they may have. But we do know they're very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to price fluctuations, environmental degradation, climate change, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what we found at the Green Foundation through a program called Farmer Link, which is very active in the Philippines with coconut farmers, is that with using digital-based agricultural extension services has helped to increase the capacity of farmers to become involved in a more reliable uh, value chain. Uh, it's helped them to understand a wider range of good agricultural practices and to track their progress in, in applying those agricultural practices. It helps to get them information on a regular basis about pricing, about input supplies, about ways to manage pests, about ways to protect crop during climatic events, which are very common in the Philippines. And it essentially is a way of coaching the field workers and the farmers to uplift their agricultural productivity. Most importantly, it helps to give a view to the, to the service providers, agricultural extension groups, suppliers, buyers, financial service providers, into what's happening with the farmer. Right? What, what are the, what's the cash flow of the farmer? What's the selling price? 
Are they seeing success in adopting new, new practices? And that information is extremely valuable for helping everybody in that value chain make improved decisions about how to uplift the farmer. Is the loan the right thing to do? What kind of loan is the best structure? What kinds of inputs should the farmer be, be using that maybe they're not? What kinds of practices are they recommending that they haven't been practicing? Another activity of Grameen Foundation is in a social enterprise. It's called Taro Works. Taro Works is a, is, a, is, a, is a social enterprise that Grameen Foundation is a sole owner of. And it provides an advanced mobile data platform to help organizations with data collection, monitoring, sales, inventory management of the field, of their field workers. So the, the data that, that is able to be pushed to field workers about the work, the products that they offer, the training that they need to give to field workers, to, to, to participants in the program, can be delivered on mobile platforms. And data about not only the, the, the performance of the field worker, but also the performance of the client can be gathered. And Tara works now, it works with over 90 social enterprises globally. It, it supports over 200,000 microenterprises that use its platform. And there are about 4.4 million people who benefit from the products and services that are provided by the TaraWorks, uh, TaraWorks uh, platform. It's a financially viable uh, enterprise now. It's taken five, six years to get there, but it is financially viable. And I, I had the opportunity recently to visit one partner uh, of TaraWorks. It's called Sistema Bio in Kenya. They install animal waste digesters, and they do it in a number of countries globally. And essentially, it's a way that they are able to manage their field force understand their clients needs for sales for service and sales and to measure the impact of their of the installations of the programs methane gas basically is used for domestic cooking and for improved fertilizer and it's also a way that there that the that the entire scheme is linked to mobile money platforms that allows for the repayment of the, the loans for the, the digesters so you know I think there's a real unfolding reality in the develop in the in the world globally but in particular in the developing world almost everyone has a cell phone it's become a new channel mobile money and digital data for reaching you know people in very very remote circumstances the growth of, of use of mobile money platforms has been astronomical in a recent study by innovations in poverty action about the the, the m pesa experience and that the the outcomes of it have been really really inspiring but it, it's a portal to provide a lot of hope, I think, for very poor people who've been subjected to this information asymmetry. But at the moment, you know, the, we, we need to think about how we use this as a framework that protects clients and promotes human development. Frameworks are emerging globally, uh, but they represent different interests and different perspectives. The dominant paradigm here in the U.S. and China and Europe are all different. Uh, the U.S. has adopted a very market-based approach, resulting in the risk of data primarily being used solely for private gain. Uh, in China, they've adopted a state-led approach, which relies on the control and censorship and risks promoting central control against common good. Right? And in Europe, their approach has been more of an activist approach, which has established rules of consent that need to come from clients. Right? None of these really are considering how we can leverage this data, this, the, the, this digital data, as a way of offering platforms for addressing the sustainable development goals or the course in the world. I'm, I'm very happy to quote, though, from India, uh, Nandan Nilkani, the chair of Infosys, and who was also the chair of the Unique Identification Authority in India, in a recent article in Foreign Affairs, points to the effort that they're doing, that they're making in India to rethink regulation and the public-private collaboration on data. And digital information in their context is being seen as a private good but, and a public, and, uh, sorry, as a public good and a private right. A public good and a private right. And they're creating platforms such as Aadhaar, the unique uh, identification platform, banking platforms, government payment platforms, a unified payment interface for banks that essentially allow interchange, allow participation of different actors on a regulated platform, but in addition, they're allowing clients control over their own data, right? And one of the concepts that they're applying in India is something called the data fiduciary, which allows, which is a regulated institute, institution like a bank for us, right, that has, 
that is able to collect information and share information according to requests that are there, but it does it at the consent of clients regulated by a government entity. So open and interoperable systems uh, in India that are subject to regulation and give uh, strong protection to clients, I think is a very compelling direction to take in empowering the poor. Uh, this approach seems to balance you know, the interests of multiple stakeholders. So we're, I, I believe we're just at the cusp of what digital information is going to do uh, to overcome that information asymmetry. And we have a, a, a second billion to, to elevate out of poverty. This could be a, a vehicle that could help to do that much more quickly than we were able to do, the, able to relieve the, the first billion out of poverty. But we need to do it responsibly. So thanks very much.